and maybe if I'm lucky, I can do this without knocking the Euro rack off. The, there we go. Okay. So today we've got a couple things we want to tackle, and I sent out a couple of. Um, that's weird. Okay, I didn't touch that. Um, I sent out a couple tweets after class of things I wanted to catch up on um, that we're going to talk about in class. Some things that kind of came to me like right after class, and I was like, "Oh, I should have said this. I should have said that." Um, did that? Did you guys catch those? Were you able to uh, take a look at the what information I sent out, or no? Ah, okay, I'm seeing one head shake. No. Did you guys? I, I sent it both as with my pen. Hold on for you. Um, both as a series of three tweets and then I sent it as an announcement via Blackboard which also goes to your email so there's like three different ways you could have seen it so I don't know what else I could have done rather than call each of you individually or something like that oh, basically well, tweets, yeah. yes yes okay uh, <laughs> um, the main thing I wanted to catch your attention with on um, that was the uh, idea that I want to talk about the project one today and get a sense of the timeline and expectations that sort of stuff um, I need to make sure I leave enough time for that after my demo. Um, so I don't, I, I may not have a clock in front of me. If we get to about the, the 9.30 time frame and I'm still jabbering trying to do something with the Euro rack, somebody flag me down and make me aware of the time, okay, basically. Um, not that you need to be watching the, the clock the whole class, basically, but you can help, help me out and make sure we have enough time to talk about Project 1 and get that started today. Um, the reading responses and looking through those this morning, um, uh, and I, overall I've been happy with people's uh, responses uh, with these. I mean, I do read through them and I do look at uh, what people are saying, so just uh, make sure that you are actually doing the reading, you are actually responding to things um, to, to that. Uh, I, I will send a message to you if I, if I think that there's something of concern uh, in what you're saying. Uh, but, let's see. Uh, somebody asked about pots, okay, and what these things are. So all these knobs on the uh, Euro rack actually have little controllers on the back end, and this is where maybe let's see here. Uh, if this works, let's see. Switch to QuickTime. I'm gonna put a video up on the screen here. Movie recording. Okay, so. Behind each one of these knobs is a little uh, variable resistor, okay? Uh, it's a, uh, you may be familiar with these. Have you ever seen these? These kind of resistors, okay? These are fixed resistors. They have a certain resistance to them, okay? They're an electrical, they're an electrical component that resists the flow of electricity, okay? So the higher the resistance rating, the more it pushes back against electricity uh, flowing through it, okay? Um, so these are fixed resistors. Inside of the control knobs is what's called a variable resistor. What happens is that you turn it to one direction and you're at the lowest resistance. When you turn it all the way to the other side, you're at maximum resistance. Okay, That's effectively what a, a variable resistor does. And this is what's behind every one of these knobs on your Euro rack. It's also what's behind the faders on your mixer. Okay, It's a variable resistor behind the scenes. Okay. Um, I'd love to tell you that it's it's between uh, blank and blank resistance, uh, but every variable resistor is going to have a different rating to it. Okay, um, and so each one is individual. Each one has to be tested and rated and put in its specific application for whatever the app electrical circuit is that you're you're working on. But I thought it'd be useful to kind of show. I've got two of them. If you want me to pass these around, so you can see look like okay this is what's inside the circuitry of your euro of the euro rack of the um the synthy as well okay these variable resistors so that, that helped to put a, a device with a name basically okay that's what he's referring to when he's referring to pots in the um the reading okay someone asked about eq versus filtering did that make sense how he started to relate those two things to each other or do you have a sense of what the the, the difference and the similarity, uh, there's a lot of overlap here, okay? Yeah. yeah? Like the whole reading was about that, so I feel like it really cleared it up. Yeah, okay, good. Because um, someone at the end was saying just that it was, it helped clarify it, but you want to make sure that, e effectively, an EQ is made up of filters, okay? And it's the arrangement of filters that determines how you can control the overall EQ. Uh, EQ being short for equalization, okay? Um, so I'll leave it at that, but, but know that 
a lot of people use these things interchangeably, but we're using filters sometimes not in an EQ fashion where we're trying to even out frequencies in the, the recording, okay? We're trying to creatively use them as a sound design element, okay? okay yeah. Just to clarify, how yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole reason it's called equalization, I mean, if you just parse that word out, you're, it's, it was originally meant to make up for deficiencies in different microphones and different sound sources to uh, boost certain frequencies, attenuate other frequencies in order to level out the frequency right. spectrum. Hardly anyone ever uses it for equalizing things anymore. They usually use it as a creative sound design element, basically, okay? So know that that's, yeah, thank you, you can just set it right there, okay? Um, yeah, that's that's really I think the 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 thing to keep in mind. But when you're talking about an EQ, you're talking about a series of filters that have been arranged for you to control the frequency spectrum inside of a sound. Okay, that's what an EQ is. Okay, um, I'm just looking around real quick at who we're missing here. I'm just gonna make a note here. Uh, okay, um, so then I don't know. Is that Hopefully you've got those connected in your mind now a little more clearly, the fact that EQs are made up of filters, okay? Um, this one, Q, did that make sense what Q is and does this formula make sense to you? Q is like the quality, like how high the quality is of the... Well, Q, yeah, Q stands for quality, but there's actually a mathematical formula that relates to uh, Q, okay? Uh, and when I say freak C, basically that's the center frequency of the bandpass filter, okay? So when you have a bandpass filter, you divide it by its bandwidth, that's the Q of the filter, okay? The reason why we have a different measure, okay? Um, talk to me about octave. What's the relationship between octaves and f the f uh, frequency spectrum? There, there, it's, a, it's a multiple of frequencies, right, for every octave. And what's that multiple? Two, right? Okay, Nico's putting his hand up. Two, okay. Uh, so, two times the frequency every time. Okay, well, talk to me about the eighth octave versus the first octave then. What does that mean in terms of the multiplication effect of the frequency? Now, it's like two to the power, two to the power of eight literally is what you're talking about in terms of the frequency change, okay? So, talk to me about a bandwidth of 25 hertz in that eighth octave versus a bandwidth of 25 hertz in that first octave. Think about that just as a, a mental uh, hypothetical, not hypothesis, hypothetical, right? 25 hertz in the first octave is a really wide bandwidth, okay? 25 hertz in that eighth octave is a really narrow bandwidth, okay? So Q was set up as a way to, to even out this discrepancy across our, our, our hearing, basically, where we hear in octaves, okay? We hear frequency in octaves. So what it does is it allows you to be stable between the first octave to the second octave to the fourth, third to the eighth octave, basically. You can define bandwidth in terms of Q, and you know that a Q then in the first octave is going to sound similar to a Q in the eighth octave. Does that make sense? Okay, that's what this mathematical formula is expressing, okay? Uh, and I know some of you are math-phobic, and I'm sorry I threw a bunch of math at you last time, basically, but uh, my, my goal in presenting the math to you is always, is never to, let's see, um, never to make you, uh, I don't know, uh, to force the math upon you, but to help demystify what the mathematics is expressing to you, okay? Um, so, it, and... Although I'm happy to get into the math with some of you that actually want to get into the math and figure out how to create new filter designs and that sort of stuff, I'm happy to do that basically. Uh, but what I, what I, at the at the bare minimum, I want to demystify what the math is expressing to you. Okay, in this case with Q with bandpass filters, it's expressing a way to keep uh, the bandwidth sounding even across those that broad octave range. Okay, from the first to the eighth to the ninth to the Umpteenth, okay, make sense. I say eighth because because how many octaves do we have on a piano? Roughly eight-ish. Yes, okay. <laughs> Eighty-eight keys. Divide that by twelve. It's not quite right. Seven and a half. 
Seven and a half, okay. So it's almost eight octaves. So eight, eight is a good kind of shorthand for the range of a, of a grand piano, okay. Make sense? Which is a, 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 I don't know, a benchmark, if you will, okay. Uh, any questions about that? Any other questions from the reading? Is it helping to get these kind of topics in class and then reinforced through the reading and it's kind of building? I mean, you, I, ho I hope that from last week, by the end of the week, you felt more comfortable talking about frequency modulation and amplitude modulation and those types of things. I hope that this week you feel more comfortable with kind of the the uh, being conversant about filters and what they do, okay, so you're more confident talking about these things, okay, that's the goal of these readings and, and how they kind of dovetail with what's going on in class, okay. Um, so today I wanted to bring back in the Eurorack and I wanted to do something with it where we are dealing with uh, frequencies and subtractive synthesis to, to modulate the timbre of something, okay. Uh, and so in order to focus our energy on modulating the timbre, I didn't want to have to worry about the pitch information. So I was working on a really quick um, max patch, which I haven't had time to post this on, um, on Blackboard yet, but I will post this on Blackboard so you can take a look at it. But all of these objects should be familiar to you at this point, yes? Okay, so who feels comfortable telling me what this patch is doing? I've even got some comments in here I might guide you along. Anyone feeling brave enough to do this? What is this patch doing? Sometimes it makes sense to start at the top, sometimes it might help to start at the bottom and work your way up. Victoria, yeah? Uh -huh. One second. Yeah, so if I wanted to change the, the pulse time, I've got a, a control here that I can actually change the pulse so I can make it faster, slower. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and type in 1,000 here so it matches, okay? It's adding one number to a second number, and this is the result oh, yeah, down here. Yep. Well, is this is this frequency or is this pitch? Yeah, it's MIDI pitch, okay, at this point, right here, okay? Yeah, the make note, which creates a note on and a note off event, right, for us, and then that goes to the note out, okay? Um, so I've got the note out connected to uh, this little guy, which I can, let's call it, uh, okay. So our MIDI interfaces in here are controllers, right? They don't have, if you haven't looked at the back of them, they don't actually have a, a MIDI out port, okay? So you can send MIDI out to hardware, okay? So I brought in something that has a MIDI out port on it, okay? It has a USB connection just like our, 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 our keyboard controllers here in class, but it also has a MIDI out port. This is also an audio interface. It's not, it's not uncommon for an audio interface to also have MIDI in and out ports on it as well, okay? Even very basic ones will have a MIDI in and out port, which can be a handy way to send MIDI data to your hardware synthesizer, okay? So that's what I'm hoping to get out of this today is I'm going to be sending MIDI out from Max to our Eurorack to create uh, some sound. Wow, it's already 9.20? Okay, maybe remind me when it's 9.35 so I have time for this, okay? Um, so my, my uh, inspiration here was actually I was listening listening to that Money Mark track, if I go back to push the buttons uh, and about, there's a section where he's playing octaves. But he's modulating the timbre, right? Along the way, okay? But the pitch information is very simple. It's just jumping octaves, right? Um, and he's doing it in a 
pretty linear fashion, I thought it'd be interesting to randomize that a little bit. So that's what I, my inspiration behind this patch was, basically, to build something that would randomly jump between octaves on an E flat, which is the, the, the pitch that he's playing in that song, okay? So where, where do you look in this patch? Where do you see in this patch where octaves are happening? What now? Where do you see octaves happening programmed into the logic of this patch? Hunter. Times 12, right? 12 why? Why do you why does 12 jump out to you as being octaves? Uh, because there's 12 notes and like you would basically I mean if you sort of like basically whatever frequency it is, you times it by 12, then it's gonna be it's gonna be like at the octave, right? Because it's gonna be because there's like 12 notes. So yeah, I, I, I like the grammatical structure of your sentence. I need to change some of the nouns. Sorry, I am get kinda geek. 12 MIDI notes, 12 MIDI, what, what do we call those 12 things, music half theory steps. people? Half steps. Half steps, yes. Okay, there's, to, to, be, to be technically proper, okay, there's 12 half steps in an octave, okay? So when we're changing pitch, if we have something that's randomly jumping between different uh, 12, and I'll turn this down and I'll turn on the patch, okay? See how this is just jump, it, this, is, this right here is putting out multiples of 12, right? And then what I'm doing is I'm adding this lowest pitch, right? Because when this is 0, 0 plus this number is going to be my lowest pitch. 12 plus this number is going to be an octave higher. 24 plus this number is going to be two octaves higher. 36, three octaves higher. 46, four octaves higher, okay? That's what I'm doing there, okay? So yeah. Why 27? 27 is E flat. Okay. Uh, if you... Uh, if you need to locate yourself in terms of MIDI pitch. Uh, it's set up so that C is always divisible by 12. So that's why the C's are 24, uh, 36, 48, 60, etc. Okay, C is always perfectly divisible by 12. Everything else is not. Okay, so you can kind of walk up the half steps from there <laughs> to figure out which uh, pitch you're you're at. Okay, uh, if that's confusing for you, I'll, uh, here I'll show this to you. Okay, uh, sidetrack here, bonus. Okay. If you go into your number box and you go into the inspector, you can, let me see here, display format. I'll zoom in here. This should be it. I can actually change this to MIDI pitch. So instead of it displaying a number, it will display a MIDI pitch for me. And so now you don't have to do that math in your head like a total geek. Um, and it's going to default to D sharp, because, but D sharp is, is what? In harmonic is the music theory term, right? It's the same. D sharp is the same thing as E flat. Okay, so therefore you can actually change the display of your number boxes to be MIDI pitches. Okay, so I've got this patch generating random E flats octaves for me. Okay, and this is where I'm going to transition over to, and I've got it patched into my my MIDI interface here. I'm going to transition over to this. If I can do this without dislodging some of my chords, I'm going to flip over to the camera so you guys can see in the back of the room. Okay, so uh, this is actually set up for the way it was last time, so I'm going to pull these cables out, okay? I'm starting with a blank naked patch here, okay? Uh, and I'm going to be working with, I did put some uh, graphics on here before I, okay, these are the three modules I'm going to be using, okay? They're all from Pittsburgh Modular, okay? Uh, there's the MIDI 3 module, which is, takes the MIDI input and turns it into a CV signal, a continuous voltage signal, that I can then use to drive the pitch of my synthesizer box, which has all manner of waveforms in it. It also does frequency modulation, but you can't dynamically patch it. That's the reason why I was doing the EMS last week. And then I'm going to be feeding it into one of our two FLTR, which is basically filter without the vowels in it, okay? So filter module, okay? We actually have two of them. And can you guys read these? this in the back? What is, these, these, should look, these names should look familiar on these outputs, yes? High pass, bad pass, low pass. What do we call that, that object in Max that has three filter outputs that, are, that just happen to be high pass, low pass, and bad pass? State variable filter, right? Okay. So what do you think is behind the scenes in this module? A state variable filter, okay? You've got one frequency control that controls where the cutoff or the, the center frequency is, but then you get these three different types of output from this one module, okay? And we happen to have two of them, okay? 
So uh, I, I put this up here to make it a little easier to see them, but I'm going to flip back over to my camera. There I am. Okay, so this should be generating a pulse. Okay, so the fact that this little light right here, I don't know, how's this going to work? Should you guys come up close or should I try to play to the camera so you can see it up on the screen? What do you guys want me to do? Play to the camera? Yeah, that'd be nice. Or you want to come if, if you want to come up close, come up close. I'm going to also play to the camera for those that want to sit in the back, okay? Okay, so there's my camera. There's that. If you want to come up close, feel free to do that, okay? Um, so this little light blinking right here tells me that my MIDI signal is coming in. This is the MIDI 3 module, okay? If I disconnect it, oh, maybe. Oh, no, that's my pulse. Let's do this here. Come on, I should get a MIDI signal out of this. Come on now. Mode, mono. Oh, here we go. These are blinking. Okay, so it's generating a control voltage. I just had to change the mode right here. Um, I don't really need it to arpeggiate. So there, are these. So it's these lights being solid. Okay, good. Okay, so if I take my CV from here, okay, and then I move it over here to the synthesizer box. It has an input that's labeled one volt per octave. That's actually going to change the frequency for me. Okay. And if I then, let's see, before I go into the filter, let me just take the mix out, plug it directly into my output module here. And if I turn this up, okay. Now, Here's where it gets a little tricky because the frequency knob will also control the. So notice the frequency knob is still modulating the pitch. Okay, so even though I'm sending a MIDI pitch in at an E flat, it's also adding in the frequency. I'm getting octave jumps, right? Okay. So I might still have to find my. really low. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to sit up, try to fiddle around for with, with an E flat. There it is. Okay. So I'm using the mix out on the um, on the synthesizer box, okay, which allows me to actually uh, play with the balance of my different waveforms. So I can turn these down and get triangle wave. Okay, I had to lean over to see what it says here. Triangle wave, okay. If I also want some of this waveform. Okay, so does this qualify as spectrally rich? Remember I mentioned that if we're doing subtractive synthesis, we need to start with something that has a lot of uh, a lot of information in the spectrum, right? It needs to be spectrally rich. We, we don't want to start with a sine wave and then go into a filter because we won't hear its effects very much. It has to have a very broad spectrum to it so that we can hear the effects of what the filter is doing, okay? So we're listening to it directly right now. Let me see. Should I go to full screen so I get that little... That thing's in the way. There it is. Okay. Okay. That's better. Okay, so now instead of going directly to the output, I'm now going to take this and go in to my filter. Okay, I'm going to turn down the frequency and the modulation and all that stuff. Okay, and if I now take the filter output, I don't know, what do you guys want to hear first? High pass, low pass, band pass? Low pass. Low pass, okay. Which should give me which end of the frequency spectrum? Low, it's right in the name, right. Okay, so now if I plug this into my output, listen to that. It's so low I can't hear it. Okay, so if I take the frequency knob now, okay, so frequency knob controls the cutoff, okay. Uh, and then in addition to the frequency knob, I have a resonance. So if I turn up the resonance, listen to what happens. Is that the wrong one? 
Oh, resonance is on the bottom. Resonance is actually narrowing the cue, is what resonance does. So back to that formula that I showed you, it's narrowing the cue on the filter, which is going to give you more of a boost right before the cutoff. Okay, so it gives you a ringing quality to the filter right before the cutoff and moving into the stop band, okay? You should hear that ringing quality. And where it gets really ringy is when the, the resonance lines up with one of the overtones. There it is. I hit an overtone there. That's what's happening basically. The resonance is lining up with, the cutoff frequency is lining up with the, one of the overtones. So you get that kind of ringing quality. Okay? Almost like a four man kind of like building a little bit of resonance into the sound. Okay? That's the connection there with the four man terminology. Okay? Um, let's see, so that's low pass. You want to hear high pass? So this, so in a low pass configuration, when I turn the filter, all, the filter frequency all the way down, I basically am getting all the sound, but then I, I move up to where I'm just getting it. You see this kind of thin quality to the sound, right? Yeah. Okay, because we took out all the low end, okay? Um, as opposed to the low pass gives it, it kind of darkens the sound because we're taking away the high end, okay? Uh, then in addition, we have the band pass filter, which is just going to give us... There's one of those... Overtones, resonance. Okay, so this is all, this is timbre modulation. This is subtractive synthesis. I'm looking at the time as well, okay? Um, what else do you need to see on this? Because effectively, we're doing subtractive synthesis here. We're doing timbre modulation. It's just that simple. What do I do? Three patch cables? If I want to make it more complex, okay, I can actually have these sit these two filters. The fact that we have two filters allows us to put them in a cascading configuration, right? Okay. So what I can do is actually take uh, let me see, should I do high pass then low pass? Let me do low pass out to my input on the next filter. And then if I take um, from there, the high pass. Okay, this is a little. This is effectively going to give us a band pass configuration where we can control the band bandwidth. Okay, on, on on either end. So listen to what we can do here. I'm going to crank up the resonance on both sides. I need this one high. Oh, okay, now I've got nothing. So if I do this, so now I'm getting everything. So now I can. Use my low pass to remove some of the highs and use the high pass to remove some of the lows. So now they're, they're working together, okay? Make sense? I can kind of shape the overall spectrum by cutting off the high and the low end and kind of do this. My spectrum, okay? Does anybody, is anybody a hands-on, I gotta touch it, turn the knobs and hear what it's doing? Or do you, what? We'll be here all day? It's, it's 9.36. It's 9.36, okay. I, how about I leave this set up so that at the end of class, if people want to take some time to uh, play around with this patch configuration, they can do that, okay? But let's make sure we talk about project one, yes? Okay. Does it help to see it, hear it in, in this Eurorack configuration? Okay, so I will leave it set up. I love that I, I turn this down. This is turned down all the way, and I'm still getting sound out of the thing. That's how loud this is. I, I, I barely have the knob turned up on the mixer over here, so uh, let me do this.
That's how loud this VCA is. Okay. Uh, hopefully I can change again without losing my wires. Um, okay. Because I don't want to overlook project one because I know some people are, some studious students are concerned about their grades and things like that. And, you know. Okay. So you guys want to know about project one and I wanted to kind of elaborate on what uh, is in the syllabus, okay? So going back to the syllabus, if you didn't get a chance to look at it, there's a few more words than are on my slides here, but effectively the required elements for your project one, okay? Uh, and if your project one is to compose something with Ableton Live, okay? There's no way around it, okay? There, you're supposed to create some sort of piece uh, from Ableton Live, okay? Um, you need to hand in your live session. This means that there's no cheating doing this in Logic or Pro Tools or Reason or Fruity Loops or whatever, basically. You must do it in live and you must hand in your live session, okay? Sorry, okay? Because one of the objectives of this class is to get comfortable with this piece of software. The only way I can do that is if you actually hand in your session, okay? So, okay, that's, that's a required element, okay? In addition to that, I want you to hand in a bounced audio file or a video, okay, with high quality audio, okay. So if you're doing a live patch that is a live set that is more performable, less composed out, okay, and you want to hand in video of you performing your patch, I'm okay with that, okay. And actually, if it is performable, it's preferable that you hand in video of you performing with your patch than than anything else, okay. Um, I'm not. I, although, I mean, I don't want, like, dark, greeny, like, I don't know, uh, uh, low-level light, uh, you know, cell phone quality. I mean, you can do quite a bit with your cell phone in terms of video quality. Yes, we can agree with uh, on that, okay? Um, this doesn't need to be a three-camera shoot with perfect lighting and LEDs, you know, cyclic lights, you know, doing that sort of stuff, okay? Um, it just needs to be a static shot of you performing the patch. The only thing I ask is that if you are doing a cell phone recording, that you do a high quality audio recording as well that you sync up with the video, okay? Uh, if you don't know how to do that, uh, let me know or talk to your classmates. I'm sure there is someone in this room that knows how to do that and can show you. It's, it's really, really, really not that hard, okay? So you need to do, what you effectively need to do is record the video and the audio at that point and sync them back up so that you've got a high quality audio to go with your video, okay? Um, any questions about those two things? Okay, um, the genre. You are limited in terms of genre. No, those genres need to be from our book, okay? You can choose ambient or pop rock or hip hop, or if you want to think of it as pop. Uh, pop and rock, I realize, can be two different genres, but uh, you get the idea there, okay? They're, they're tied together in our book, so I'm tying them together in our genre selection here, okay? Um, my reason for doing that is that in each of those chapters, he talks about some some... Uh, ideas, some processes, some things you can do in live to get those types of uh, uh, genres out of your computer, okay? And we've talked on a few of those things as well in class here. The 12 bar blue session that I uh, gave to you guys, the, uh, the ambient session that I brought in and, and showed you guys, okay? Um, you can use some of those techniques as starting points, but my, my advice to you guys is to pick a genre and go with it, okay? Uh, don't try to, I don't know, do this masterful 10 minute genre bending, multi-movement uh, project here, okay? You're just now starting to learn live, so this is your, I mean, if, if you're, you're at the beginning stages of this, look as this kind of your beginning project, okay? Um, it needs to be at least two minutes, okay? Um, I set the bar at two minutes intentionally here because I don't want those of you that have, uh, that are maybe, uh, have, have, less experience on the music composition side to freak out about the fact that you've got to create this six minute magnum opus, okay? Uh, but maybe you're one of those composition majors that's looking at creating a project for your final uh, recital, so feel free to stretch your wings a little bit, compose something a little bit more in depth, something a little bit longer, okay? Um, so, I, and I mean, I, I, I set the bar at two minutes to kind of set the minimum, but feel free to kind of move ahead with that. Uh, so long as you create a complete work, okay? Can we agree on that? Um, I don't want a the first eight minutes of your 30-minute live symphony that you're writing, basically, okay? It needs to be a complete work, okay? Uh, beginning, middle, and end, it needs to make sense, okay? 
Uh, and then a short paragraph. Uh, I don't know. I don't want the word short to be misleading. Short doesn't mean quickly written five minutes before I handed the thing in on Blackboard, okay? Make sense? Th if, you, if it helps for you to think of this as program notes or to think of it as a blog post that explains what you're listening to, think of it that way, okay? It doesn't need to be long in terms of breadth. I'm not asking for a five-page paper, but I'm also not asking for something that's, that's hastily written, okay? It doesn't say hastily written paragraph connecting two ideas. It says short, which means brief, okay? Uh, and sometimes writing things that are short actually takes more time. Yeah, Katie? Uh, do you mean just like what we did, basically, like how we did it? Is that something? Uh, think of it as you're, this is you explaining to me and or other people. I mean, one of the things that we're really keen on is helping you develop your portfolio. So think of this as you're speaking to an audience that is hearing your work for the first time, not necessarily me. But, but maybe someone who stumbled on your portfolio website, your portfolio, and is hearing this work for the first time and is kind of interested in wondering about the processes that you've set up, okay? Does that help? Okay. Um, and I want you to connect it to, to two assigned readings, okay? Um, what I mean by that? Well, uh, if you end up using filtering in a significant way in your piece, you can connect it to one of the readings on filtering. Okay, um, you know, talk about Strange and his ideas of analog processing and analog filters and the fact that you use the cutoff frequency and that sort of stuff. Okay, um, I, I'm, this is me asking you to apply the techniques that I've been making you read about. Okay, uh, I, I mentioned and I've reiterated several times that I, there are no tests. Right? Okay. But I do want you to connect it to your readings, okay? This is, the, this is the way you prove to me that you're actually applying the knowledge that I've been having you read about, okay? Make sense? Any questions about these required elements? Okay. Uh, does it help for me to expand upon them this way? Do I need to write all this down, or does me recording class over this slide so you can play it back on YouTube later count as me expanding on this enough? Yeah, okay, I'm getting a thumbs up and a head nod. I'm going to go with that, okay? Um, <clears throat> again, class is on YouTube, so you can actually look at this list later there. Um, feel free to take a cell phone shot if you need to, but uh, you can, okay, you can dial it up on YouTube later, okay? Uh, I want to be clear about this. What are not required elements at this stage? It is not required that you use Max for this first project. It is not required that you use the EMS Synthi. It is not required that you use the Eurorack for this first project, okay? Um, that does not mean it's forbidden for you to use these things, okay? You can use these things, and if you want to use these things, you should use these things, okay? Uh, but it is not required at this point, okay? Project 2, it will be required that you use one of these things for Project 2, okay? So that's the kind of step up from Project 1 to Project 2, is that you have to add in one of these elements, okay? Make sense? Uh, but let's get live nailed down first. I want to simplify focus. And, and even within live, there's a lot that you can do, right? Yes? Okay. Um, I think one of the best things you can do is put limitations on yourself. Don't try to do all the bells and whistles in live all at once. Okay. Put limitations, put boundaries on yourself so that you can be creative within those boundaries. Okay. I can't tell you what those boundaries are for you, but you can, hopefully, you've got enough of a sense of the lay of the land of what you can do with live at this point, what you can do with electronic music, that you can put those boundaries upon yourself, okay? Um, I'd much rather see um, a really well done piece that uses, I don't know, two instruments than something that is really poorly composed that used every instrument in, in the Ableton Live set, okay? I'm on record saying that now, okay? Make sense, uh, but for this for this purpose for this project, you're not required to use one of these elements. You will be required to use it for project two, okay? Uh, but you are not barred from using one of these elements, okay? So if you want to step up and try this, feel free, okay? Timeline, okay? Uh, I I worked backwards. So two of these dates, the last two of these dates are in the syllabus. I worked back from frontwards from these to kind of build a timeline as far as how we need to work through these projects, okay? Um, and in case you're keeping track at home, uh, Friday, October 7th is actually two weeks from today. So this is real. This is happening. This is like, you better get started on this now, okay? 
Um, so uh, what I'm saying is that if you want me to hear something prior to the first draft hand in, I'm going to ask, rather than take up time in class, because I still have things to cover, this week, uh, October 3rd and 4th, I'm going to be covering the hip hop and the sampling stuff as well. Okay, uh, So we'll still be covering new information the week that the drafts are due. Okay, But if, you, if you're someone that wants to get started on this and you want early feedback, please come to my office hours on Monday or Tuesday, the 3rd and 4th. Okay. That's the time to bring in a draft and have me listen to it. It doesn't need to be the live set at that point. You can maybe bounce the file and bring it into my office if you're concerned about it. Configuration, uh, carry over to my computer versus the machines in here, that sort of stuff. You can do that. I, I just need to hear something at that point. Okay, That's totally optional. That's not required. But I realize some of you would like feedback, uh, more feedback earlier and often, uh, and that's my... my uh, suggested and recommended and requested path for you to do that, okay? Rather than bring it to me in class or five minutes at the end of class when everybody's packing up trying to rush out, okay? Um, come to my office hours on those days, okay? If you are deciding to do a cover song, I want to know a week in advance of the, the hand-in, okay? Uh, I want to make sure that you've thought through the ramifications of doing a cover song and I want to have a discussion with you, okay? So I ask for at least one week's notice if you're doing a cover song, okay? Um, that's also to prevent people from saying, you know what, this original composition is not working the night before and say, you know, I'm just going to do a cover of this, uh, I don't know, spleen clutch, I don't know, whatever band sound, song, basically, you know, that sort of thing, okay? Yeah, Daniel. Can I use like, a, like an acapella in my song and make like a different instrumental for it? I, that's what I want to, I want to know about it a week ahead of time, okay? Uh, I just, I've seen it too often where people are like, they get frustrated with what they're trying to do original and they throw it out at the last minute and they try to do a cover song and it ends up being not so great, okay? So I want to, that's to protect you from making those kind of bad last minute decisions, okay? Commit to it early, yeah. So there are no, like, um, like mandatory things that we need to do in live, like certain audio effects or like filters that you are, requirements? At least... Two of those things need to be concepts that we've been talking about, and you need to be, be able to discuss those in your paragraph, okay? Like, how did you use filtering in this song in some unique and creative compositional way? How did I use fr frequency modulation or amplitude modulation? Th these, these concepts that we've been talking about. There's no specific, like, you must use this, 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 okay? Um, by Friday, October 7th, okay, I'm going to set up a Blackboard submission. I want to draft by Friday, 4 p.m., okay? That's basically so that I can download them before I go home for the weekend. I can listen to them over the weekend so that when we come back to class on Monday, we can have some workshops in class where I'm helping people, okay? Um, obviously, it's a, lot e it's a lot easier for me to help people in class if I know what you've been working on. Uh, and I can also, at that point, target people that I think might have might need more help than others, basically. okay. There's some people where I'll hear their draft and I'll be like, you're, you're doing fine. You don't need my help. I'm just going to get out of your way and let you go. okay. Um, I'm happy to answer questions for you, but okay, that helps me kind of target the people that need help more than others if I get a draft. And that draft just needs to be a bounced audio file, an MP3 or a wave at that point. okay. Uh, and then it needs to be, comp we have workshops in class, so those two days, the 10th and the 12th, I come in with no agenda other than helping you with your projects. Uh, and then by Wednesday the 12th at noon, which is the day before fall break, okay, just so you're keeping that in your mind if you've got other tests and things going on, okay, it needs to be done by noon, everything needs to be handed in, okay, all those required elements. How am I doing on time? I've got no minutes left, which... I need to flash this up here real quick, okay, as you guys are packing up. Uh, the points breakdown, and maybe I'll, I'll um, talk about this. Uh, let me think. I'll bring this back up on Monday, okay, to reiterate this, okay. Uh, keep in mind, I, I expect that 24, 20, this is a 25-point assignment, okay. 25, 24 means that everything exceeded expectations. 22, 23 means that some things exceeded expectations. 20, 21 means that you met expectations in all these required elements, if you start getting into below expectations and you start missing elements, that's when you start sliding down to this end of the spectrum. Katie. On those workshop days, if we finish before then, do we still have to be here? Um, if I've given you the all clear that everything's done and you're good to go, yes. Okay. But keep in mind, this kind of... I, I will try to be as honest and open with you as possible about whether you're meeting expectations. And if you're good with a, everything meets expectations and I'm, I'm okay with a 21... 
well, feel free, basically. Okay. Um, that's what I have for the project. Does this help you know how to get started on this project? Okay. Um, I didn't get a chance to mention this, but I'll talk about this on Monday. Uh, finish Chapter 5, get started on Project 1, okay? I'm here with the Eurorack if anybody wants to play around with this.